May all living beings be happy. We chant that every evening. They say that Ajahn Mun would spread thoughts of goodwill to all beings three times a day. First thing in the morning when he woke up, then in the afternoon when he woke up from his nap, and then at night before he went to bed. Goodwill for all beings, that's the context of our practice. It's the frame for what we're doing. Well, one happiness that everyone can share. Or at the very least, we want a happiness that doesn't take away from anyone else's happiness. Because you notice that you are included in all beings. The Buddha is not asking you to sacrifice your well-being for that of others. I just want you to think about the possibility that the best kind of happiness would be the happiness where everybody is happy. Now, how are people happy? It's through their actions. That's another one of the contemplations we do every evening. All beings are the owners of their actions. Whatever they do for good or for evil, to that will they fall heir. So when you're wishing that all beings are happy, you're wishing that they understand and act on the causes of happiness. Those act in skillful ways, the way they act with their bodies, the way they speak, the way they think. So when you're spreading those thoughts of goodwill, that's the thought you're spreading. May all beings act on skillful intentions. And skillful intentions are informed by right views, so may all beings have right views. This is why when the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, it was an act of compassion to help beings, anyone who was willing to listen, anyone who was willing to learn, understand where true happiness comes from. This is a point that's sometimes missed. Again and again we hear about Theravada as being a small-minded practice where you're only trying to look after yourself. And the Buddha, in teaching the Four Noble Truths, was talking to people who had limited hearts and limited minds, couldn't comprehend the idea of everybody's being happy. But that's really a misrepresentation. The Buddha's idea of happiness was that it's possible for everybody to be happy. But because happiness is a matter of skill, you can't push other beings into happiness. You can't force them to be happy. You can't simply sit there and think nice thoughts and expect the whole world to fall in line with your nice thoughts. You have to work on your skills. And in working on your skills, it's not that other people are getting neglected. Because as the Buddha says in one spot in the texts, a person who's stingy cannot gain jhana, a person who's stingy cannot gain the noble attainments. So there has to be a generosity of heart, a generosity of spirit underlying the practice. When you find good things in your practice, you're happy to share. But your sharing is indicated in that phrase that we chant about the Dhamma, reading, O Banaiko. You have to bring it into yourself first. And then ehi basiko, then you bring, then you call other people to look. Of course, they can't look at the results that you've gotten, but you can call other people to look and say, "Look, this is what I've done. I found true happiness. Maybe you want to try it too." That's really how you help people in the best way.
and then maybe they can learn from your example. It's like that old joke about if you give a person a beer, you get them drunk for one night, but if you teach them how to brew, you've got them drunk for life. Well, the same principle works with the Dharma. If you're simply nice to people, they'll feel your niceness for a little while, but if you actually teach them how to be skillful, how to understand suffering, how to work with suffering in such a way they can get beyond the suffering, you can get them released for life. That's why when the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, it wasn't just setting out four ideas, saying the compassionate way of dealing with these four categories is to, one, try to comprehend the suffering, that's the First Noble Truth, to the point where you can understand the cause. Once you see the cause in action, then you try to let it go. That's your duty with regard to the Second Noble Truth. And then you try to realize what it's like when you let go of the craving, the cause of suffering. So that realization is the duty with regard to the Third Noble Truth. And the way that you do that is to develop the path. It's the Fourth Noble Truth. So these tasks that the Buddha points out that are appropriate to the Four Noble Truths, these are the tasks of goodwill, these are the tasks of compassion, both for yourself and for people around you. Like right now, we're trying to work on developing the path, developing our mindfulness, developing our concentration. Trying to foster the qualities of the mind that allow us to see suffering clearly. See exactly where is their stress right now, and what can we do to, to minimize the stress? What can we do to understand why it's there? And John Fuhrer once noted that one of the major turning points in his meditation was after he'd been suffering from chronic headaches for a long, long time. There was one night when he'd been sleeping and his situation, his condition had gotten so bad that they would have other monks come and stay in his room to, to help him when he woke up at night. Well, he woke up one night and everybody else in the room was sleeping. So I said, well, there's no help from them. So he decided to sit and meditate, and he realized that one of the problems was that he had been trying to get rid of the headache, get rid of the pain, rather than trying to comprehend it. In other words, he had been applying the wrong task, and that had only made things worse. So he said, okay, let's just watch the suffering. And in doing that, he said he came to some important understandings. So it's this understanding of the appropriate tasks. That's where you are kind to yourself. And you're kind to others. You can think of yourself. Say you're lying in the hospital and you're sick. If all you can do is moan and groan, you're not the only person who's suffering from your pain. The people around you are suffering from your pain as well. If you can make up your mind that you want to comprehend the pain, okay, that means you have to develop the qualities of mind that would allow you to comprehend the pain even when you're sick. This is why it's important that we try to learn how to meditate in any situation. When we're strong, when we're weak, when we're tired, when we're not tired. Which is why you want to learn how to meditate, both when you feel like meditating and when you don't want to meditate at all. This is a duty not because somebody has imposed it on you, but this is the, one of the duties of compassion. If you really care for yourself, this is what you do. You try to find ways of maintaining your focus, regardless of how well the body is or how sick the body is, regardless of whether it's daytime or nighttime, regardless of any situation outside. You want to learn how to apply yourself to the appropriate duty at any time, in any situation, because that's the compassionate thing to do in any time, in any situation. We don't like to think of 
the word duty combined with compassion. So maybe you want to might just say one of the tasks, you know, the activity. This is how compassionate activity works in your life right now, whenever the right now is. Figure out where you are on the path. Are you ready to comprehend suffering? Are you ready to take it on? If not, work more on the path, on your powers of concentration, your powers of mindfulness. Because it's the compassionate thing to do, because it minimizes suffering, helps you get a proper handle on it, and you act as a good example for others. A teacher had an old woman who would come to meditate with him, and she was already seventy. She hadn't meditated ever in her life, and she became quickly very good at concentration. And her motivation for practicing was that she was suffering from illnesses, going through a lot of pain. And so she learned how to sit with a lot of pain, and yet not suffer from the pain, separate her mind out from it. So ultimately, when she was on her deathbed, she went to the hospital. She was suffering from pains in her stomach. So they opened up to do some exploratory surgery and discovered she had a very advanced case of liver cancer. They realized they couldn't do anything with surgery, so they sewed her back up. And during her last days in the hospital, every morning the doctors and nurses would gather in a room and she'd give a little Dharma talk. She didn't ask for painkiller. They asked her, are you in pain? They knew she was in pain. She said, well, I'd rather be alert than taking the painkiller. But she'd learn how to separate the pain from the mind, separate her awareness out from the pain. And as a result, she was a help not only to herself, but also to the doctors and nurses looking after her. That's an ability that's worth aspiring for. Because it's the way you show true compassion to yourself and to the people around you. So always keep these duties, these tasks in mind, comprehending stress and suffering, abandoning its cause, realizing its cessation, and developing the path to its cessation. In a practice, this means while we're meditating, it's not a case that you simply see states of concentration coming and going and states of mindfulness coming and going and say, oh, that's nice. It's a lesson in impermanence. The other night there was a, I was reading one of the Dharma talks by Mubhaska Gee, and she was making this point that you've got to keep your awareness as solid and continuous as possible. If you find that it comes and goes, you don't just say, well, that's impermanence, that's inconstancy, and just let it go at that. You've got to do what you can to keep that awareness solid, keep that awareness continuous. That's the development part. So you can use it as a tool. You can use it as that path to the end of suffering. For all of these teachings have as their taste, as the Buddha says, the goal of release, which is the most compassionate thing there is in the world. This is why he taught it. He, after gaining his awakening, he could have done all kinds of things. After all, he'd taken care of his own issues with suffering. But he realized the kindest thing was to teach people about suffering and the end of suffering. That was his gift. So it behooves us to take advantage of his gift, because it's the best way we can show compassion, goodwill for ourselves and for all the people around us. <laughs>